if you really want to be successful at this, right? So you want to you want to create a partnership that's going to thrive, that you can build into a, a company that's going to reward you. You have to have a shared vision. That is David A. Fields, Umbrex member and the author of the Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients, Six Steps to Unlimited Clients and Financial Freedom. David advises many boutique consulting firms, and over the years, he has seen partnerships thrive and partnerships fall apart. On today's episode, David shares some observations on how to make a partnership successful. We also discuss the idea of adding an advisory board to your firm, and we spend a few minutes on how to select the right gift for a client. Thanks for listening to Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman. If you like the show, I invite you to subscribe to the weekly Unleashed email, where you'll get summaries of each recent episode, book recommendations, and consulting tips. To sign up for that, go to askunleashed.com or you can just shoot me an email at unleashed at umbrex.com and I'll get you added to that list. Hello, David. Welcome to the show. Hey, Will. It is always delightful to talk with you. So, David, I'm often, uh, you know, talk to independent consultants who are thinking about, they say, well, you know, I'm kind of thinking about, you know, partnering up with somebody or maybe they're even thinking about joining a small firm with two or three other partners. You deal with a lot of boutique firms as well as independents, and you've so you've seen a lot of you know have a high in on this, a high a high lot of observations. What are some things that you think work well with a in a, in a partnership, and what are some things to look for in a potential partner? What are some th- times that where you've seen partnerships dissolve or not do so well? Wow. First of all, that, that is a great question and an interesting topic. And by you know uh, happenstance in some, in some ways, yesterday I met with uh, two different firms, one of whom's a client, one of whom's not yet. The one that's a client, they are a longstanding partnership, uh, many, many years, well over a decade. And I'm helping them dissolve that, transition that. But with the other firm I talked to yesterday, They had been a three-person partnership, and it didn't work out, and now it's down to two people. And the day before yesterday, I was meeting with another firm. All these firms are up in Toronto because I happen to be in Toronto. And there was one person who who owns it. He's built a a nice little firm. Well, I mean, right now it's around 10 people. He co-founded it. It did not work out. So partnerships have a tendency to be very unstable. To, to dissolve, to not work out. Um, you, you may or may not know that when I um, created Ascendant Consulting, my, my consulting firm, I co-founded it. And I often say when I'm on stage and, and presenting that you know I co-founded Ascendant and that partnership worked incredibly well for about four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> right? it's, a, it's a great last line, right? Always works. At which point it, it, it dissolved, it fell apart. So... I think it's it's very difficult, and and what I've realized is there are some important things to think about in a partnership, and important things to to look for. Perhaps the the most important will what I've seen is that if you are going to have a partnership in your consulting practice, if you want someone to share the consulting practice with, share the burden of developing business, share the burden burden of thinking, have someone to talk to, all, all of those great benefits of, of, of being in a, a partnership. Your relationship with the partner has to transcend the business. And it really needs to predate the business. While there may be some partnerships out there that are exceptions to what I'm about to say, as a general rule, I have not seen any partnerships that are built solely for the purposes of, of creating a business. Meaning, we you know we happen to work together a little bit. We found we liked working on projects together, and so maybe we'll be partners. I haven't found any of those that survive. The relationship has to be larger than just working together. It has to be larger than just the business. It has to transcend what you're creating for clients because the stresses in a partnership are so high that if you don't have something bigger, if you don't have this feeling for each other that you want that, you know, a relationship, not just a business relationship, a relationship where you, you look out for the other person, where the other person's interests in your heart, where you have some shared goals, some shared aspirations outside the business. If you don't have that, it won't survive the stresses. And, and and so if you're thinking about 
you know, so who should I partner with? And you're in a partnership. So it would be interesting to get, you know, your perspective on that and, and whether, you know, your relationship just, you know, transcends the business. But, you know, if you're thinking about, well, I want a partner, that might, I, I may have just thrown some, some cold water on it because I've lowered the, uh, or reduced the pool of uh, potential partners quite dramatically. And uh, yeah, and I think that's true. I think the, the pool of high potential partners for anyone is actually fairly narrow. Now, over time, you can meet people and you can build that relationship and expand that relationship with an idea that, you know what, maybe someday we'll create a partnership. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll go into business together and see if this works. But I would build the relationship first. That, that's my initial thoughts. What's your reaction to that, Will? Yeah, no, I, 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 I think it makes sense. Uh, you know, I don't, you, you've seen a lot more repetitions than I have. So I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm, uh, I want to probe this a little bit further. So uh, yeah. for someone who, for, let's say for someone who is an independent consultant and kind of thinking up of, of saying, hey, it'd be useful to, to, to kind of peer, pair up with someone – yeah. Um, so that we can work together on business development and execution. And yep. what's your guidance for that person? Is it you know, would it be, hey, why don't you just try just kind of working together for a while, but you can kind of ha- you know just have separate you know separate uh, LLCs and you can ten ninety nine each other. And if and you know on a particular you know particular client, you can just agree, okay. You know, this is how we're going to split any revenues or whatever. But you don't actually have to be, you know, partners in an LLC together. Is is that sort of what you suggest for a while? Like, do that for a year first? Yeah, that's one hundred percent what I suggest. the The question comes up around branding, right? And around around well, who do we present ourselves as? And, and are we, you know, going to present ourselves as a company or not? And I actually think there's too much emphasis placed on that. That question, which feels very important to the consultants, is not important at all to the client. <laughs> they actually, they, right, they don't really care. They're hiring you or one of you because they trust you. And in all likelihood, there's there's a leader. There's someone who's who's winning this piece of business, and they're bringing the other person in. Maybe they brought them in as part of the pitch, but still, there's a leader. There's someone who owns that relationship. And so, just go in under the leader's banner. You know, it's, uh, put, put your ego aside if it ha- doesn't happen to be your banner and, and go in there and, and that's fine. So I would absolutely recommend doing that. The, when you jump into a partnership, um, it, it's, it's like a marriage, right? Very much like a marriage without some of the benefits. <laughs> what can go wrong though, and, and almost what invariably does go wrong, it, there are a couple of things. One is usually the visions are not 100% aligned. Because almost no two people's visions are 100% aligned. And so where you want to take the, the company it, it can be a bit different. And it's just like when you're, you're shining a, a light or, or picking a point on a compass, right, or on a map. If you're, you're one or two degrees different, at the start, that doesn't matter. Because one or two degrees different for a few steps or a few yards or a few hundred yards or half a mile, it doesn't get you that much very far apart. But as you go further and further out, you know, on the map, as you're getting into miles and leagues and, and some other unit of measurement that's even further, all of a sudden you're quite a distance apart. And so if you don't have a, a, a really well-aligned vision, it can be problematic. And that's why one of the partnerships, matter of fact, in some ways, that's why both the partnerships I talked to yesterday broke up. The other thing that very often happens especially if you're saying, let's share the load on business development, let's share the load on delivery, is, as you know, this is a very lumpy business, right? Business development is, is, is quite difficult. And sometimes you're succeeding and sometimes you're not. Right? Sometimes you're hitting the ball and sometimes you're not. And some of that has to do with you and some of it just has to do with the vagaries of the market. And when one person is succeeding and the other person is not, Unless that relationship is incredibly powerful, and unless you've really talked this stuff through in advance, it's highly likely that the one who's producing revenue will start to resent the one whom, and I'll put air quotes around this, they're carrying. And once resentment starts uh, creeping into a relationship, any kind of relationship, that relationship is in for some, some tough times and will have trouble, trouble surviving. So I would recommend exactly what you said. I would recommend kind of a light partnership, not a not a, a legal partnership. 
D- does that make sense, Will? Yeah, it does. And uh, you know, on that piece, do you have any suggestions of what you've seen work well on how to split up the the revenue? You know, so I can imagine, you know, some firms might just be completely even Steven, you know, or 50-50 yep. partners. But then other places might, you know, market, okay, if you bring in a lead and, you know, you get 20%, the person who, if we deliver it, that's 80%, and I did half the delivery, you know, some kind of formula, right? So what have you yep. seen in firms that really partnerships that, that survive work well over time in terms of how to split the pie? So compensation is a whole podcast in and of itself, or probably a, a, a whole podcast series. It, it seems to me if there are 100,000 firms out there, there's probably 300,000 comp approaches because they've all tried a couple. The array of compensation approaches is pretty extraordinary. And again, so happens this morning I was talking with a firm about their comp approach and, and something they were doing and how I would adjust it. You know, what, what works best? Well, it kind of depends on the people involved. Generally, I'm not in favor of a, just an eat what you kill approach. You know, meaning if, if if I get the revenue and I work the revenue, I get the money, because that's not actually a partnership. So if you're going to try to create a partnership, then then you have to share, and and you have to be collaborative. Now, could you take you know award either on a points basis or on a percentage basis the the revenue based on what what's been sold and what's been worked? Um, yes, and I and I think it's it's wise to do that. But if you are going to create a partnership. You know, in in reality, as opposed to just working with someone, if you're going to create a legal partnership, then you need to find some sharing at sort of the gross performance level. So, as a as a firm, how did we do? And are we going to share? We can share that fifty fifty, or based you know, however you're going to determine your equity. Sometimes that equity changes over time based on performance. It, Will, this is such a complex topic. <laughs> I'm not I'm sure I can actually do it justice quickly. There are there are a lot of ways at it. The best ways seem to reward collaboration and recognize the partners have to recognize that different partners have different strengths and different partners will perform better or worse at different times. And you have to have a long view. If you have a short view, again, the partnership won't survive because this business is just too variable Mm -hmm. for any one person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did that help at all? No, that, that's helpful. So, so if you know, if a couple of listeners out there are thinking about, you know, uh, getting getting together as a partnership with two or three partners, what are the things that they should think? Th- so, the, I guess the first advice is yeah. to say before you you know create your own LLC, work together for you know several projects, work yep. together for a year. What, what's the next piece of advice in terms of what are the considerations right. when you when you set up a partnership? So you're better off with four or five partners than with two. Interesting. Okay, four or five partners are actually much more stable than two. And if you have four or five partners, you, one of them is going to leave. Maybe two of them will leave. You know, they'll be disgruntled, but you can still survive. Mm-hmm. Right? You can still be an entity and have some shared shared vision. So a, a just a one plus one partnership is it tends to be the least stable. If you really want to be successful at this, right? So you want to you want to create a partnership that's going to thrive, that you can build into a, a company that's going to reward you. You have to have a shared vision, and and you can't leave that kind of um, well. Yeah, we just want to grow. It, it has to be a, a more defined vision. Grow to what? What's a success look like? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If, let's put ourselves as a partnership two years from now and look back. What has to have happened for us to be successful? For us to feel happy about the progress. So that conversation has to take place. I would say if you're going to build any kind of firm, which if you're talking about three or four partners, you might be talking about a firm also, right? You're talking now about having junior people beneath you, possibly uh, other folks to help you out, possibly. In whether you are or not, I would talk, uh, I would have a conversation about culture, right? This is kind of like before you get married, having a conversation about religion. I would have a conversation about culture. What do we want our culture to be? And my sense on culture is culture is what you decide when your values are in conflict. Meaning if we value having family time and one of the reasons we want a partnership and we want everybody to, and we love being independent um, consultants, small consultants is because we can spend more time with our families. But at the same time, we value client delight. What happens if a client 
needs something, has to be delivered, and delivering that is going to conflict with a planned family vacation. What's, what will we decide as a firm? What will be our, our, our guide? That defines your culture. And different partnerships will have different answers to that question. Mm-hmm. But I would talk about that in advance. You actually need to, to understand how to bring on new partners, how, what to do if partners are going to leave, right? have those kinds of discussions in advance. Mm-hmm. Right? So all the stuff that you know you're supposed to do in your personal side, personal mm-hmm. life also, right? have a will and have things planned out and all that kind of stuff, you really should do in a partnership too. And the last thing I would say is the, the best partnerships seem to consciously seek diversity. And I mean cognitive diversity. So, you know, to me, it doesn't matter whether, you know, they're, they're, you know, male or female or young or old or, or all of that, but the way they think should be diverse because if you're going to have a partnership and make it valuable and everybody does thinks the exact same way, you're, you're missing out. Mm-hmm. There's no one filling in the gaps. So you need that diversity and you need the ability to live in a diverse team. Any other kind of culture questions? Like I, I loved your example about, you know, if something conflicts with a family vacation, what are the other kind of culture type key diagnostic type things that you'd say, are we this or are we that? Well, I, I, I'll give you a, um, a process instead. All right. Okay. So what, when I'm doing culture work with clients, what I first do is say, let's, you know, what are your core values? And so what you should do is each of you and, and your, your potential partners should each just put down what do you think your core values are, and and those can be, those can and should be anything, anything and everything, and then you should prioritize those values, and come up with scenarios where those those values could be in conflict. Which is why you know since since um, having some flexibility and delighting clients tend to be core high priority values for most firms. Coming up with a scenario where those are in conflict is was just pretty top of mind. But you don't want to just do it in a hypothetical or you don't want to do it in sort of this abstract, well, family versus cl- delaying clients. You have to create a scenario. You have to create a situation because that's where the, the actual decisions are made. Mm. If we believe that we're going to be a supportive, family-friendly environment and one of our, our employees is, gets sick, but we also said we're going to run a high profit firm and we're going to make sure our margins are at least 30%. How do we deal with that? Right? How will we deal with that situation where we're going to have a completely unproductive employee, but we want to retain margin? You know, legal questions aside. Yeah. So my takeaways are day before you get married, you know, try just yeah. working together. Just pick one of the other person's LLC and work through that. Look for four to five partners, not just two, um, to have a more yeah. stable firm. Talk about what if someone leaves, what if we want to bring in someone new, and uh, get really clear alignment on vision and culture. Yeah, that's a good start. There are other pieces, but yeah, that's, that, that will certainly get you headed in the right direction. Let's turn to a separate topic. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, boards of advisors. Mm. I know some consulting firms have done a nice job at this. You've probably uh, worked with boutique firms that that, that yep. have done this. Not the board of directors; it's you know like a public company, but a board of advisors that yeah. gives advice. Um, you know, I've I've a- heard people ask me about this to say I'm thinking about doing this. Do you have any advice? I don't. So I'd love to <laughs> love to, you know. I, I so I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts on. And I guess typically. They might be paid something or maybe they get, you know, tell me a little bit about boards of advisors, how that works, why people do it, what are the benefits, you know, how to, how to do it right. Again, what a fascinating topic, not what I was expecting. So first of all, most firms do not have a board of advisors. It's a, it's a standard question in my uh, firm growth lab diagnostic, right? I ask about the board of advisors and, and I don't know how many, how many firms I've done, right? Tons. And almost none of them have a board of advisors. There are a couple who do, but they're, they're the exception. So if you don't have a board of advisors, I wouldn't feel like, oh my gosh, I'm missing something you know, huge and vitally important because I've seen firms go from you know, zero to, to 25 and $50 million without any board of advisors. I think the real reason the best <laughs> board of advisors 
are uh, folks who can make introductions. So the real purpose of a board of advisors is not just to give you strategic advice, which they possibly could. It's to open doors for you. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so they become people who understand your firm, who get your firm, who you know, are not going to be part of your firm, uh, but probably have connections inside the industry. They can give feedback. They can give general advice. They might be able to give uh, uh, advice on industry trends also. Um, but what they can really do is open doors and those are the best advisory boards in my opinion. And how does that, which, which which is quite different from perhaps what you were thinking in terms of, well, but what about people who just, you know, can help me, you know, tell me better direction? No, it kind of was what I was thinking actually. Okay. (laughs) That was sort of my, my, my intuition is that, you know, that's the main reason that a firm, you know, these boutique firms would do it. Yep. And have you, you know, it sounds like you've. You know, most firms that you see don't, but the few that you've right. worked with that that do, how does yep. that typically work? So you get someone relatively senior, you know, maybe it's a former CEO yes. or a former director at a consulting firm. Like, you know, well, what's in it for them? Are you giving them like a referral fee on the stuff, or do they? Yeah. You know? So yeah, it can be. Um, you, you usually want someone with a big name. Where I've seen it also work well is you you have on your board of advisors someone who's connected in a prominent way at a university, Mm. especially um, at a university where executives are going for continuing ed, Mm. right? So, so I don't care so much, you know, no, no offense meant to my own sons, but I don't care too much about, you know, kids who are in school from a professional standpoint. However, executives who are paying 30 grand to go to a, a one week program at Harvard, or who are going, you know, paying a large amount of money to go to an innovation program at Northwestern, mm-hmm. um, or something like that, right? Or at Stanford. Those folks are great prospects. Mm. And so, having one of the professors who um, it, it participates in that in that program on my board of advisors can be quite useful, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Because that can be a channel in. And what they get in return is sometimes they just like to help. Um, believe it or not, but they can either get a stipend or they can get a referral fee. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so, uh, sometimes they'll feel like that's a conflict, and so they won't want that. Mm-hmm. They might get a um, a platform in some cases to test out their own ideas. Okay. So the, the, that university affiliation I've seen work really well, and as you said, sort of a, an industry star or standout or someone who who is famous in their own right. Um, can be can be helpful for opening doors, and yeah, generally they'll expect a piece. Okay, all right. What, what do you, what have you seen is kind of a kind of the range of typical referral fees it, across the industry in general? You know, sort of um, most common referral fee for all the time it seems to be ten percent. Ten percent of first project. I've seen it much higher. I've seen it lower. I've seen people try to base it on on uh, profit rather than revenue. Generally speaking, as long as uh, it's usually just the, the most common is we'll give you ten percent of the first project we get with that client. If that first project is you know obviously just like a, a little diagnostic or a pilot that quickly leads to a follow on, we'll give you a piece of the follow on also. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, it's just ten percent. Again, you know, we're assuming a normal project gross margins you know, 50%-ish. If the gross margins are 10%, we can't give you 10%. You know, but most of those arrangements are, are done, like, you know, y- you and uh, someone talking on the phone and saying, what do you think? Is 10% fair? And they go, yeah, 10% is fair. <laughs> right? So I, I would actually tend to stay away from formal written stuff. In that. Can I bounce another one off you, David, that you were yeah, totally, sure. totally unprepared for? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <All right. laughs> it makes it fun. <laughs> Let's talk about gifts. About gifts? Gifts. Yeah, gifts. Like, you know, gifts yeah. can really, I think, strengthen a relationship if they're done really right, but they can yeah. also um, really be taken the wrong way and, and, and actually kind of alienate someone. you have any thoughts? Can you, can, have you given me examples of those? Yeah, I can give you an example. I mean, one that stands in mind is once I spent an hour with someone like who was thinking about setting up their own independent consulting practice, you know, spent an hour of my time, and... uh then they sent me an iTunes gift certificate for ten dollars. 
it would have been much better off to just <laughs> say thanks, you know? Like, I mean, it, uh, I mean, I understand the gesture and it was, you know, appreciation, but really it's like, it would have been much better to send me like a thank you note and <laughs> say, I appreciated your advice than, than that, you know? And, uh, so, <laughs> I mean, well, that, you, you think they, they think that it, it sort of implied some, some devaluation of your time? Well, yeah, well, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, you know, you wouldn't tip some, you know, you, if you tip a waiter like one penny, you know, it's, it's uh, like says that was not very good service, but better just not leave a tip at all. You know, exactly. I, I mean, my time might be worth more value to me than $10, you know, an hour. So it just, it, it came across as like, maybe this you know, a little, just odd, right? Where, yeah. uh, you know, and I wouldn't have, you know, I'm not saying that I would have been more appreciative if they sent me one for like $100. That would have just been weird as well. So I think, you know, it's nice to receive a gift. Like my friend uh, Josh Dick at Ernex, uh, uh, who is the president of the Scone at Ernex, would send out, there's like this unique kind of small boutique uh, bakery in New York City that makes these massive cookies. So he would, one year right. he would send out like Godiva chocolates and like no clients responded or thanked him. And then another year he spent less money sending out these like big hunking, you know, one pound cookies or, you know, massive fist size cookies. And right. you'd only get like four or five of them in a box, but they were packaged nicely and it was kind of a unique thing. Right. And he got like all these thank you notes for his like gift. Right. Um, right. So I think some things can come off well and some things can really, you know, rub people the wrong way. And yeah. what, you know, just sending out swag or gifts, I was wondering just if you have experience with, you know, maybe, you know, just seeing a lot of consulting firms, what, what for some firms do that seems to work really okay. well and what kind of gifts maybe just people ignore or don't get any, you know, thanks at all. So um, I, I'll be able to speak more from personal experience than from um, firms because most firms don't, don't do this at all, or if they do it, they do it poorly. The situation that you described is, is, is actually quite funny. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and I'm sorry that happened. And what it's showing is, I suppose, a, a lack of understanding and, and a lack of uh, thinking right side up in, on many, many fronts. The, sorry, there's a dinging in the background. All, all my alarms are going off. <laughs> the, what I would say about gifts, and this is something that you yourself do well, Will, is you understand that a personal statement is more important than a transactional statement. A $10 iTunes card, unless and during your conversations you were saying how much you really wanted to, to like get these couple of songs on iTunes or something like that, it, it, it's just transactional. There's nothing personal about it. Um, interestingly, I think you can make a, um, a gift personal on either side, meaning all of my clients, when I sign a new client, um, this will be like a little uh, a little incentive for people to, to sign up as clients, or if you're listening. All of my clients, when they sign, get a box of chocolate in the mail. Now, that chocolate is local. It's high-end chocolate, and it's, and it's nicely packaged. And it comes with a note from me, right, that, that makes, you know, sort of uh, uh, some humorous statement around it. I'm very nice stationary, I might add. In my, exactly right. I'm very nice stationery. <laughs> Thanks to you, Will Bachman, for pointing out the right place to get that stationery. Moo.com. I love the uh, uh, correspondence cards on Moo.com. And uh, Ex you sent me one, one a while ago. It was very nicely done. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I, I learned from you. So as, and I learn everything, right, from others. And, and that one's directly from you. That getting chocolate, um, I o almost always, probably 95% of the time, clients will give a good reaction which is, you know, pretty positive, but it's a lot of my brand is tied up in chocolate. And because I talk about chocolate a lot, because I eat a lot of chocolate um, and I receive a lot of chocolate from folks. So if I talk to someone for a half an hour or an hour, rather than getting a $10 iTunes card, they might send me a box of chocolate. And I don't take it as, wow, you really just, you know, that's all you valued my time at was, you know, a $15 box of chocolate or whatever it was. I think of it very much as, as you know, that, that was thoughtful. Because they know that that's what my brand is about. So the gift can be about your own brand if you have a strong brand. That makes sense. But the gift also making it about the other person is, and, and making it a little bit more, seem more thoughtful is, is everything, right? It, I don't think it was the $10 value on the, on the iTunes card that alienated you. I think it was the lack of personalization. Oh, yeah. No, that's right. I mean, it, 
like I wouldn't expect anything, right? So it wasn't like right. the dollar value. It was just weird. It was just like as if they just sort of dropped a ten dollar bill on the table. Like here you go, right? It was just, you know, it, <laughs> right? It, it, <laughs> exactly. It just, Which is what they did, right? You know, in American speaking, right? So there's no personalization. So I think gifts work well when they're not over the top, by and large. I did receive a hundred and fifty dollar box of truffles once from France, I think, and that was appreciated. It wasn't necessary, but it was appreciated. You know, but it, it, they don't have to be large. In fact, I think that can sometimes go astray. They just need to be thoughtful. And if we're being thoughtful in a gift, I think that's fine. You know, and then the other watch out, of course, is when you're dealing with corporate people. Quite often, you can get you and them into hot water by sending a gift. Yeah, if it's and you do have and you do have to be quite aware of that. If it's too valuable or whatever, like more than ten bucks or twenty five bucks or something. E- exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you know, rather than sending a ten dollar gift card, send them a nice note on Moo Stationery. Yeah. Right, a handwritten thank you or handwritten appreciation card goes miles. Or send what we call, we have inside our client experience, we do actually have a place where we try to do a, a GAD gift. We've got one coming up for one of my clients who's up in um, the uh, upper upstate New York, and I know he's a big hockey person. And so we're probably going to send him, you know, we'll just send him some hockey-related paraphernalia. Mm-hmm. It'll be a few bucks, it won't matter, but I know it's about him. He'll get it that it's about him. Mm-hmm. What about what about? I mean, so it's it, if you're doing something maybe at the holiday time, it could be you know pretty hard, impossible to you know do some customized thing. What about sending out you know company branded swag or something? Is there anything that you've seen kind of work actually pretty well? And things that you would say avoid that? Like, well, we send out chocolate, and that that seems to work reasonably well. The uh, but I think it's you know I don't think it has a huge impact yeah. to be honest. I think some people get so much swag and whether it's branded or not, when, when you send out branded swag, it's obviously self-serving. Right. So I, I don't typically see that works terribly well. There, there, uh, hopefully some listener will say, here's the exception. Yeah. This is what I've seen. <laughs> um, you know, cause, cause I would, I would, I would love to see that. But I, in general, I haven't seen branded swag, you know, do much. Hmm. Okay, cool. So David, another great episode. Thanks for joining. We talked about, partnerships, talking about advisory boards, talking about gifts. It's always great having you on the show. Will, Will it is so much fun um, always talking with you. I always learn when we're doing this, and I hope that the, your, your listeners learn. It is, it is just uh, always a delight. It's always fun. And let's make sure we mention your website, davidafields.com, and where you can find what? You can find your blog, which I love every Wednesday morning. It's the first thing I read, and links to your books. And what else can people find there? Yeah, well, yeah, I would say that the articles are there. You can get at least a little description on on some of the ways I work with with uh, different consultants and consulting firms. And if you sign up on occasion, on on pretty rare occasions, there are uh, special things that happen, whether it's uh, an event or you know uh, um, some sort of program that I'm offering. And uh, but yeah, I would go for the content, <laughs> or at least for the cartoons. They amuse me. <laughs> People come for the content; they stay for the cartoons. <laughs> exactly alright David thanks a lot for joining <laughs> thanks so much Will thanks for listening to this episode of Unleashed I'm your host Will Bachman if you like the show I invite you to subscribe to the weekly Unleashed email where you'll get summaries of each recent episode book recommendations and consulting tips to sign up go to askunleashed.com or to shoot me an email at unleashed at and I will get you added to that list Thank you.